Season 4 of Angel is brought to you by Assure is the leading provider of special purpose vehicles and fund administration. With over 5,000 completed transactions and $2.5 billion under administration, Angel listeners can get 20% off their first SPV at assure.co slash angel. Zeus Living gives you a place to come home to for trips of 30 days or more. Stay with Zeus for beautiful, thoughtfully furnished housing. Go to zeusliving.com slash angel for $200 off your first booking. And LinkedIn. You already know LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network. It's also a better way to find great talent. Go to linkedin.com slash angel and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Angel, the sister podcast of This Week in Startups, where I talk to investors. And today we've got an amazing guest. Arguably the three most important companies in the last two decades, Facebook, Amazon, and Google. Our next guest worked at two of those three, Facebook and Amazon. Additionally, he runs the largest angel or startup fund, early stage startup fund in the world right now. When I saw the announcement that KOTU was making a $700 million early stage startup fund, I thought, that's crazy. Nobody's ever done that before. He's got to come on the pod. He's also <clears throat> in rarefied air. He has made over 100 angel investments. And I know only a half dozen people who've done that. Today on the program, Dan Rose. Thanks for coming on the pod, Dan. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, so you worked for Bezos from what, 99 to 2000 something? 2006, yeah. How did you get that job? When did you become aware of Amazon? And <laughs> take me through that first day. You know, I was uh, I was in business school at the time, uh, and I was looking for a summer internship. And it, Amazon was the hottest company on the planet. You know, Jeff was on the cover of magazines, and I didn't know anything about technology. Uh, the internet was obviously starting to become a thing, mm. but I just felt like I had to work for this company, and so I started asking everyone I knew if they had a connection there. Mm -hmm. And um, through a friend of a friend, I was able to meet Andy Jassy, who at the time was a director of marketing. He's now running AWS. He was nice enough after I bugged him four or five times to take a meeting with me. Only um, took four or five times. Yeah, exactly. They didn't have an internship program at the time, so I just basically had to bulldoze my way in. Email, 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 yeah, until text. he said, I'll take the meeting. Yeah, and then uh, I had the great fortune of um, somebody at the school I was going to, University of Michigan, mentioning that Ram Sriram, uh, who had recently joined Amazon to run business development, um, was a University of Michigan alum. I was at Michigan ah. Business School. And I cold called him. I sent him an email and I said, I really want to work there this summer. Um, I, I want to do business development. And he wrote me back an hour later and said, we're looking for a summer intern. Call me. And the next day I was on a plane to Seattle and got a dream summer internship. Uh, and four weeks after I started there, I dropped out of business school and stayed on full time. So you did the first year of business school. Yeah. You get the internship. Yeah. And you're like, what is the point of going back <laughs> exactly. to business school? This thing is a juggernaut. Yeah. What was the footprint in 1999 of Amazon? Had they gone public already? The company went public in 97. Got so it. it's founded in 94. Right. Uh, it was only five years old, but it was already a public company. That was back in the day when- 500 employees? Companies went thousand? public. We had a couple of thousand, but a lot of them worked in the warehouses. Ah, so right. in headquarters, it was probably, you know, I don't remember, but it was probably like 500, something like Got that. Got it. And you go to work. Tell me the, the moment you met Bezos. Where were you? What was the room? And then how loud was the, la how loud was the laugh? <laughs> because that laugh, people hear that he has that laugh. It's a true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. The laugh shakes the room. It knocks you over. It knocks yeah. you over. Yeah. So take us to the and first honestly, meeting and the first laugh. The laugh is so brilliant because it's such a part of, and especially back then when nobody knew who he was, it was such right. a part of his persona that attracted people like me, hmm. right? I mean, I was actually interviewing at the time for for Facebook, I mean, for, for Facebook, for Amazon and Microsoft. Oh boy. And this was 99 when, you know, Bill Gates was really had this persona of being, you know, the evil empire. And right. here you have Jeff Bezos with the laugh and, you know, he's got this incredible startup and changing the world. And so it was just such a great marketing technique. In addition to being authentic, that really is who he is. It is. And, uh, you know, I met him. I was just, to me, I stayed at the company for seven years. Six and a half of those years were the dark days of Amazon. 
Dark you know, how? March of 2000, the wheels came off the bus, the internet bubble burst. Right. Amazon was the poster child of the internet bubble. Three months earlier, Jeff was time man of the year. And by March of 2000, people were starting to write stories that Amazon was going out of business. So he's the villain. And and he's now the- Overnight, the, he went from the hero to the villain. Overnight. And when I joined, so, just to give you a sense moment? of that, when yeah. I joined the company, the stock was $60. A year later, when my first year uh, vesting happened, it was $50. In between that time, it had doubled. So I was at 120 and then at 50, and three years later, it was six bucks. Wow. So, in, and you're in your 20s. I'm in my 20s. And I've you're got watching like hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity. Exactly. I'm guessing yeah. as an intern, just Which was, get wiped out. For and me, it, my for entire, you was everything. Yeah, everything. Like paying off my business school loan, you know, kind of thing. And it so, must have been terribly distracting. It was distracting. A lot of people left, but the reason I stayed was because of Bezos. Uh, I really believed in this guy. I, Felt like every time he got up in front of the company and talked about why this is going to work, mm. why it's actually a good thing that you know we're going through this, I felt like he was right. You know, why did he think it was a good thing you were going through it? Do you remember that? His view was, you know, what Amazon was trying to do is really hard, and as a result, it was going to be very difficult for somebody else to to replicate it. Ah. And so, yes, it was expensive, and there was this huge scaling cost. But that was actually an asset, not a not a you know a weakness. And the thing that people were getting wrong about it was as soon as we could sort of leverage that capacity to you know become cash flow positive, not relying on the markets anymore, it was going to be you know kind of off to the races. And that's exactly what happened. It just took you know seven or eight years to kind of prove out. And at the time, was the majority of the business just? books and CDs and electronics. It, it yeah. had a very narrow offering in 99, didn't it? Yeah. When I joined, it was books, music, and video. Uh, toys and electronics launched shortly after that. I actually joined the retail team and launched the computer store. I ran the cell phone store. So it was kind of store by store expanding into new categories. And then the most exciting thing I did at Amazon was the last two years I was there, I incubated the Kindle. That's really where I got to work with Jeff. Up to wow. that point, I was a middle manager doing different things. And then suddenly I was working on one of these really exciting new areas. And, you know, take it me was to that moment incredible. where he says, I, we're going to do this Kindle. Yeah. Because that was like a top secret. Like when that dropped, yeah. people don't remember, but it was the equivalent of the iPhone drop. That's right. Take me to the moment where they take you into the room and say, we're doing this. Because yeah. that was, how many people knew about it? 10 people in the company? Yeah. yeah. 20? Yeah. Something in that range? Yeah. Take me to the moment. He tells you, I want you to so, run this. So uh, I was friends with Steve Kessel at the time was running the largest part of Amazon's business, which was the books, music, and video business. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also where all of the companies uh, cash flows came from. Right. And uh, Jeff went to Steve one day and said, I want you to um, start a digital media business for us. And you know, at this time, the iPod had already been out and digital music was a thing. Uh, and Jeff said, we can't let what happened to music happen to books. That's our core franchise. We have to, we have to do to the book industry what, what Apple did to the music industry. And Steve said, great. Yeah, let's do it. I, I want to, you know, bring a couple of the people that I have working on those core businesses today, and have them move over and, and start doing this, and and we'll and we'll do it. And and Jeff said to him, "No, you don't understand. You're going to do it." Whoa. And Steve said, "But I'm all, all I'm all in. Let's do it." And and Jeff said, "Steve, effective tomorrow, you've you've been fired from your job of running our core business. We're promoting the guy who is the finance." Uh, person for that business, a guy named Greg Greeley, who's now at Airbnb. Uh, he's going to take your job and your new job is to run, is to build a digital media business. And you're the only employee of that team. Go build a new team. And your job is to kill your old business. I mean, is that the brilliance of Bezos? Is that Incredible. the innovator's dilemma to him Yes, is nothing? He internalized the innovator's dilemma. He talked about it openly and he knew that the only way this was going to work is if he separated the two teams and his and he gave the mission to one team to go destroy the existing business. And by the way, remember, the existing business was the entire company's profits, cash flows. It was their core business. It'd be the equivalent of Tim Cook right now coming in and being like, you know this iPhone that prints money? Yeah. Destroy it. Yeah. You made the iPhone? I need the three of you to go to another room and destroy it. What would destroy this? And then that might actually be happening with the augmented glasses. Who Maybe. knows? 
It was a, it was a remarkable move, and and Steve and I knew each other, and so when I heard about that, I told him, "Hey, I gotta I gotta come help you with this." And I was the first person on the team that was working on the Kindle. What, what did you see in terms of the growth of Bezos over that seven year period? Because he had gone through the fire, he went from hero to you know villain, mm. and those seven years were the really the seminal trial by fire. Yeah. Coming out of it, what was what was the difference in Bezos from 99 to 2007, in your opinion? And, and what is his genius? Because he is a genius at business management. Is that his genius? Is it I operations or I think is it people? I think he's an absolute visionary and he's a strategic mm. machine. Strategic machine. Unpack that. What does it mean? So if you think about um, a couple of things. First is early on in the company, the book – business was doing really well and was actually profitable. And he immediately realized that um, this was a much bigger idea and pivoted to get big fast and build a moat. He understood at a deeper level than most people, because we all read about moats and we all read about, you know, the innovator's dilemma. He internalizes that stuff and he, he just lives it. Hmm. And so, you know, he immediately shifted into, we're going to build this thing as fast as we can, get as big as we can, because that's our protection against com competition. Uh, then, you know, the capital market shut down and he realized we have to pivot to being uh, cash flow positive because we're not going to be able to rely on the markets anymore. He turned this massive ship on a dime. It took about 18 months. It was not easy. Uh, went from losing over a billion dollars a year at the height of, you know, the the bubble popping to um, being uh, capable of, you know, generating positive cash flows, uh, which was a remarkable feat. I was there and 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 that to me, I mean, I, I was there knowing that this thing might not work, but realizing that I'm going to learn more from this than I would from any successful kind of experience. How did he do it? How did he take a billion dollar losing business? Because this is very prescient, in yeah. fact, Yeah. because we're in another moment. That's right. Exactly like that. Yeah. How does one go to a team that is spending, also known as investing, Yeah. the criticism from, you know, outsiders might be you're spending like a drunken sailor for people like us, you're investing in building a foundation of a business that could be worth a trillion dollars someday. Yeah. Which is really weird. Like, why do people look at investment as like burning money? It's just journalists don't understand this basic concept that you invest to build right. market share. It's so weird, isn't it's it? It's a tough one to get your head around when you're talking about the scale of investment that these companies are making. And the reality is, I think the markets do play a role in requiring companies like that to show some amount of discipline, hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, you have to be able to do both. You have to be able to invest, but you also have to be able to run a business. How did he do it? Did he just lay people way. off or just raise prices or very everything? Few, very few layoffs. Um, raise prices was the big one. And that was a tough pill to swallow. The company's growth stalled out, actually. Oh. It, in that time frame, growth went down to single digits, um, year over year, year over year, as growth. opposed to going up twenty percent. As opposed year. to going up, I think at the time it was probably a hundred percent year over year. So, so all of a sudden, you radically decelerate the growth rate in the company, uh, and you know, as a result, the stock went from one hundred and twenty at its height to six dollars. Right, everybody's mm -hmm. underwater, so you have massive issues with employees. You have to figure that out. A lot of huge challenges, but. Um, Ultimately, what needed to happen was the company needed to get kind of reset to a place where it didn't rely on the markets to support itself and then could kind of rebuild from there. And, you know, a lot of blocking and tackling along the way, they shifted out of uh, being reliant on Sun Microsystems and, and moved to uh, Linux, which was really the seeds of what ended up becoming AWS. Mm. Um, but just, a, you know, a lot of things that, that basically saved the company money and allowed it to be self-reliant. And, and the, the thing I give him the most credit for because all of that stuff is like good operating right and and he had jeff wilkie at the time who he had brought in who's an exceptional operator now runs the retail business who really played a big role on this and and a lot of other people around the table that did that but the thing that is so remarkable ab about jeff is in the middle of all of that and you can imagine the disruption that that creates at a company he launches in 2004 in the middle of all of that AWS and the Kindle, two massive new bets, one of which was designed to destroy the existing business and the other of which nobody thought Amazon had any right in the world to be working on. 
And that was crazy. He did it in the middle of it. He didn't wait till the company had exited all of this and the stock was back up. When I left the company in 2006, the stock was $13. Oh, my Lord. And we were already two years into AWS and, and the digital media business that's now Fire TV and all of these other things. All right. When we get back from this quick break, how does his performance in turning around that company from money losing to... I think his idea was make a dollar and like invest everything else into the company, but but you know, crossing that chasm, making that pivot. I want to know how that relates to today with the companies we're seeing now who have been in investment mode and now the markets are demanding that. And then we'll go to your second chapter, Facebook, and how you got the job at Facebook, another rocket ship when we get back on Angel the Podcast. If you're an accredited investor or if you're a founder, you need to understand what a special purpose vehicle is. You've probably heard people in the investment community say SPV. You might have heard me say it for the syndicate.com. SPVs. We run SPVs, and that allows us to have up to 250 accredited investors invest up to $10 million into a company. And there's only one item on the cap table. So if you're an angel investor with a bunch of rich friends, you can start your own syndicate powered through an SPV. You've seen these SPVs on all different websites around there. Well, here at launch, we could not be more pleased with our partnership with the team at Assure, A-S-S-U-R-E. They power the syndicate.com. We have almost 4,000 members in our syndicate and Assure has been amazing for us through over 125 syndicates and we've put tens of millions of dollars to work. Assure is the leading provider of SPVs and fund administration with over $2.5 billion in assets under administration. That's AUA. And they have over 5,000 completed transactions. They know what they're doing. They've developed an innovative software uh, platform called Glassboard to automate the entire investment experience from entity formation all the way to an IPO. It's slick. It's beautiful. They're doing a great job with it. And Ashley, who manages the syndicate here for us, uh, loves the interface. She's told me great things about it. And I, you know, I see it as well. It's uh, obviously they're they're uh, just building something absolutely beautiful. It's like the future of investing. So. Not only do investors love it, but founders love it as well because it keeps their cap tables nice and clean and simple. They also manage the entire process over the life of the investment. To get 20% off your first special purpose vehicle, your first SPV, I want you to visit Assure, A-S-S-U-R-E dot co slash angel. So go ahead and get 20 of your friends together and do a group investment. Maybe you find a great company, you got 20 friends, and you say, you know what? I found this great deal. I'm putting 25K into it. I wonder if my friends want to put 5, 10, 25K into it as well. We'll do an SPV. And you know what? This will help you get into deals. In my experience, if you're writing bigger checks, you get more rights, you get more access to the founder, and you get better deal flow. Uh, Thanks to our friends at Assure. Uh, We love the company, and uh, they've done a great job for us. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, everybody, it's going to be one of the top 10 episodes of the podcast ever. Dan Rose is with us. As I said before, um, worked at two of the three most important companies of the last two cycles, and uh, he's seen the booms, the busts, and uh, lived to tell about it. Before we end our Amazon chapter of your career, uh, which obviously was foundational, how does his ability to manage Wall Street and get through that relate to what we're seeing today with Uber, Lyft, and other money losing companies that have unbelievable growth and scale? Yeah, I think, you know, first, like I said before, the market plays a role in requiring these companies to demonstrate that they can not only grow, but also do it in a disciplined way. The public markets. The public markets. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, what what Amazon, you know, the, the, the muscle that Amazon built during that really tough time was the ability to run a massive operation in a disciplined, organized way. Again, I, people like Jeff Wilkie played a big role in that. And also invest in an event in ways that Amazon is, you know, maybe the best in the world ever at doing, which is really where Bezos shines. And I think his ability to surround himself with a leadership team. If you look at that leadership team today, most of the people on that team have been at the company from the time that I joined in 1999. People like Jeff Blackburn, Jeff Wilkie, Andy Jassy. These people have been at the company for 20 plus years. Why are they so loyal to him? Why are they so loyal to Amazon? What is it? I think it's, you know, you you work for somebody like that and you realize this may be the greatest business person ever. Right. Where am I going to go? 
How he's am I going to replicate He's certainly in the that? argument for greatest business executive ever, isn't he? Absolutely. I mean, I'm trying to think of anybody. I mean, I mean Henry Ford, you know, he's, he's in that sort of, he's in that category. Echelon. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Do you think the current crop of companies, the Ubers, the Lyfts, how quickly can they do this? If he did in 18 months, because we're looking at Uber, which obviously I'm an interested party. Yeah. Um, I still have a large position. Congratulations. Oh, you know, even the losers get lucky sometime, like Tom Petty said. <laughs> uh, broken clock, right? Not sure about that, but 11 okay. times. <laughs> I always tell people I got lucky 11 times. <laughs> I like that. I think, you know, at a certain point, if you just keep placing bets, we, we talked about this yeah. in makeup. The index approach to the index investing. works. I've done you know, that. Yeah, it works. Yeah, you know, if you're here in Silicon Valley with great deal flow, yeah, I don't see how you lose if you're consistently betting over a decade. Yeah, there was an AngelList article about this recently. The there index was. approach, right? The index approach yeah. said it works. Yes, they looked at all their deals. Yeah, if you have good deal flow, if you're in the epicenter, yeah, if you're in, you know, a second or third tier market where there's never an outlier, you're not going to hit an outlier by definition. So it can't work. That's right. But the outliers do work. Uber now cutting costs massively, getting out of money losing businesses, did 1.7 million deliveries and rides, lost like a billion. So they're losing something in the, you know, whatever, 25 cents per ride. Why is everybody convinced that their business is broken if they could simply raise prices like Amazon did, 25 cents or 50 cents a ride, which would make no difference in consumption? or little to no difference. I just think it takes time for these things to play out and oh. to see kind of, you know, how the story unfolds and mm. I, I don't have a, you know, personal perspective on on how that one's going to play out, but I yeah. do know having been on the inside at Amazon, it, it was it was not a it was not a like ob it was not obvious that the company was going to emerge uh, mm. from that from that crisis. Yeah. Um, I I stayed with it because I really believed in Jeff. And I also was early in my career and I figured, you know what, even if this doesn't work, I'm going to learn more from this than I would from an experience where everything goes up and to the right and, you know, we never experience any kind of, you know, real uh, challenges. So to me, it was, it was a great opportunity to, to go through something like that. Um, but there were smart people at the time, you know, real analysts on Wall Street who really believed and, and had a legitimate argument that Amazon was six months away from going out of business. When you look at where it is today, we'll end on this with the Amazon chapter, what surprises you about where it got to today, if anything? What's the big like surprise there? Is it AWS? Is it that people don't leave? Because there was this, I don't know if you remember this New York Times story, where they did this huge story about how many people think it's the most oppressive place to work ever. And I looked at that article and I was like, this feels like fake news, not to get all Trump on people. I mean, obviously it's cannot stand Trump, but I just looked at it and I was like, this makes no sense to me. How are people, like people we know, there for 25 years and say it's the greatest job ever, and then other people, you know, the New York Times writes this story, it's like, it's fairly obvious that a certain type of person, this is the perfect company for. Yeah, I think, you know, cultures, every company has a different culture. To me, the important thing is having a strong culture, a right. culture that's defined and has sharp edges. And um, Amazon definitely has that. It's not for everyone. Mm. Um, Who's it's it tough. It's for people who are hyper competitive, who are builders, right? Mm. They put people in positions to own something and to build right. um, and who are comfortable with, uh, you know, not having a lot of the touchy feely kind of, you know, uh, cultural benefits of uh, a lot of Silicon Valley uh, companies. When I, when I was there, I don't know if this is still true, but I suspect it is. Um, when you walked by the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, snacks, snack bar, there was one thing in it and that was uh, black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bring your own half and half. Yeah. You want, you want stevia? That's right. on you, bud. It's on you. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so... Oh, there was water, too. There was water. Yeah, free water. Free water. Yeah. All you could drink. Seattle's best. Mm, Seattle's best. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, the thing that's amazing to me is the loyalty of people there is phenomenal, and the ownership he gives people is phenomenal. But you have to 
in order to take ownership and be given ownership, you, you have to earn that. You have to put in the time. Mm -hmm. But boy, are people loyal to him. And that AWS business coming out of nowhere yeah. and beating Google, Microsoft, IBM, Rackspace. I mean, who would have expected the bookstore yeah. would become the most important technology company as well? Yeah. Well, I remember when Jeff announced it internally to the company. Um, and again, a lot of people were scratching their head. Why is this, you know, retail business trying to do something in infrastructure? Um, and he he said a couple of things that stuck with me. One is he said, in the early 1900s, if, in order to start a company, you had to build an electric power grid to power your store or your building. And he said, it's crazy that today, in order to start a company, you have to build your own data center. There's no reason why that should be the case, and we're gonna mm. we're gonna fix that. Wow! And I thought, you know, that was the power yeah. of Jeff. He had this ability to kind of connect dots um, and yeah. see around corners in ways that you know history uh, doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Yeah, for exactly. sure. Yeah. How did you wind up meeting Mark Zuckerberg? You were what the hundred twentieth, hundred thirtieth employee. Yeah. So that means you joined in year two or three. Yeah, year two. Year two. Yeah. Were they on University Avenue yeah. still? Yeah. And they had what, like five offices on University Avenue in Palo Alto? No, at the time I joined, there was one. One? Yeah. Was it that the Excel building or something? Now? It was in the building that was above uh, the Indian restaurant right there on the corner of High yes. and University. Yes, the yeah. Indian place. Yeah. What's the name of that place? It's uh, It's been changed a couple of times. Couple times. It's still Indian, but it's still a, Indian. different. Yeah, different I've name. been there. It's good. Yeah. Um, or and the, the skateboard version. shop was downstairs too. Love that place. So Who I- Who recruited <clears throat> you? How did you find out about so one it? Of my, one of my first managers at Amazon was a guy named Owen Venata. Uh, Owen and he Venata. was running business development at the time. And I was a yes. you know early uh, junior business development manager. And- um, and I spent a year working for him. He promoted me and, and really kind of gave my career its first big uh, kickstart. And um, and Owen ended up uh, joining Facebook in 2005. He was the first COO of the company. He took over after Sean Parker had left um, and was there until Sheryl uh, Sandberg joined. And so um, he and I had remained friends. And he called me in 2005 and said, hey, you really ought to come down here. I think this is a special company, this young guy. Uh, the founder, I think, is really exceptional. Uh, but I was working on the Kindle. And he knew that because he had been at Amazon in a senior position before leaving to go to Facebook. And I said, you know what I'm doing here. I can't leave. Like, this is the most exciting thing I've ever done. I'm working directly with Jeff on it. We hadn't launched yet. Um, it took, actually, the company three and a half years to launch the Kindle from the day wow. that Jeff fired Steve Kessel and asked him to take on this new job to the day the Kindle launched, three and a half years, which wow. is amazing to think about in today's you know, compressed timeframes, but um, Jeff was also a perfectionist and wanted the product exactly right before it shipped. And so I was right in the middle of this thing and I just told him I can't leave right now. But it kept gnawing at me and I, I kind of was one of those things where I was waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it. Mm. And so finally I said, you know what, I got to go at least meet this team and, yeah. and learn more about what this thing is. So I came down and um, interviewed and, and my last interview was with Mark and I spent... 45 minutes uh, with him and I left that room thinking I think this kid because at the time he was 21 22 years old really could be the next Jeff Bezos like yeah. I just had this instinct about him and the business itself appealed to me for two reasons one um, at, when I was at Amazon there were two companies that kind of started after Amazon, but ended up eclipsing Amazon in terms of their success. One was Google and the other was eBay. And what eBay had that Amazon didn't have was network effects. Amazon was a retailer, eBay was a marketplace. And what Google had that Amazon didn't have was a high margin advertising business. Amazon's margins were like 3% and Google's were like 60%. Yeah. And I looked at Facebook and I thought, network effect business with an advertising business model this could be big. <laughs> yeah, it's like basically the confluence of two of the greatest forces that business has ever seen. That's it. Virality. It's that simple. Plus margin. Yeah. And so um, I left that uh, you know, interview and uh, told Owen, I'm ready, to, I'm ready to do this. And I had always known eventually 
that I was going to uh, go start my own thing. That was kind of my dream was to be a founder. And um, I thought, well, you know what, if I'm going to do that, I need to be in California uh, and I need to get some experience at an earlier stage company. Uh, cause when I had joined Amazon, it was already, as we talked about five years old and kind of, you know, a public company. So, um, I saw Facebook as an opportunity to kind of do that. And then of course, 13 years later, I never left and it wow. turned out to be the greatest ride of my life. What was, uh, the footprint when you joined in that year too? Had it broken 10 million? 7 million users. 7 million. It was growing. Uh, I remember it was growing at about seven or 8,000 new users a day. Wow. It was still a college-only social network. Right. And the reason I remember that is because six weeks after I joined, two seminal things happened. One, uh, we launched a news feed, which turned out to be, you know, at least at first, uh, a total disaster. Uh, and then two weeks after that, we opened it up to uh, anyone who wanted to join, not just college students, which many people thought we're gonna was gonna take down the, the company and the way the, f the just so people understand before newsfeed you would visit individual people's pages right and see what they posted on their board That's so right. it was a series of individual message boards yes basically yeah or what we called at the time um graffiti boards i think was one term on the internet or like sign-in books where you would go to somebody's web page and yeah. just write a message and it was like That's your right. sign-in board. It was board. called The Wall. The Wall. It was yeah. called The Wall, right. Yeah. So if you wanted to understand what was going on, you would just click on your friends and you'd be like, oh, there's Dan's Wall. But could you post on, you could post yeah. on Dan's Wall. Yeah. So you'd post on each other's wall and yeah. you were like hunting and pecking. That's right. But was it Dave Morin who decided the feed was a thing? And Had anybody done no, that? I guess. Dave. Friend feed or Twitter had done it? No, this was before this was before, before uh, those. those services. I mean, at the time, really the only thing, the only kind of feed like experience that existed was RSS. RSS, right? Yeah. Dave Wine. This was RSS. really before sort of the feed. Right. And, and in fact, everyone, every product effectively that's uh, launched a feed since Facebook copied Newsfeed. Right. Because Newsfeed was the first truly kind of consumer. Who made that there? Who was the architect of that? Was it Dave it was, Morin? Or? No, no. Dave hadn't joined the company yeah. yet. It was uh, Dave. Dave kind of was the uh, developer evangelist after we launched the platform, Got it. which came about six months later. Right. Um, and he joined around that time. It was really Zuck. I mean, right. Zuck had this vision for Facebook and it was so much bigger than anybody at the time really understood. This is again, yeah. when I interviewed with him, I started, my eyes started to open to what this could be. But the vision was, um, you know, an identity platform for the web at mm -hmm. its core, the social graph powering that, and the idea that information was going to be open and accessible. And to him, the idea that you had to go to different people's pages in order to find out what was going on, when in reality, it was all there in the system, and all we had to do is show it to people. Yeah, It just seemed obvious. And that's the reason that you know, six weeks after I joined the company, and keep in mind, I had moved from Seattle with three young children and had made no money at Amazon. So I literally was renting a house in Palo Alto and betting my career and my family on this company. Six weeks in, we just turned on newsfeed one day. It wasn't like, yeah. hey, we're going to test this and we're going to, you know, see how people respond and then we're going to gradually expose people to it. We just flipped the switch. Hmm. Because Mark thought this is going to be great. Everybody's going to love it. And yeah. of course, in the first 24 hours, they hated it. Oh. And uh, and then in 48 hours, they started to kind of get their heads around it. And within a couple of weeks, our engagement rate just went through the roof. It was a hard technical challenge, too. People don't remember that That's databases right. weren't designed to make a custom feed of objects for, at the time, 7 million members. That's that right. means 7 million database instances of those posts because each person's was unique. Yeah. Well, a lot and more those than had that. to be updated. Yeah. You're talking about a database instance every time somebody changes their profile picture, which used to happen six or seven times a day because that was the way people would kind of post photos. Yeah. That every was time their, somebody was wrote no on their wall, the time. no photos. Every time somebody wrote on someone's wall. Right. Every time somebody changed their status update, you know, each of those became a database instance. And then the algorithm needed to say, of these th changes, which ones are going to be interesting to Jason? Yeah. 
because the things that but are in the first version, Jason there was no different. algorithm. It was just chronological. no. There was an algorithm. It was. It was. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's interesting. I thought it was always just chronological at the start, and then it went algo after that. No, right out, right out of the gate. In fact, it was the opposite. We started with the algorithm, and then when Twitter came along, we switched to a real time feed, and then we switched uh-huh. back to the algorithm because it turns out people actually don't like the real time feed as much. So the the thing that um you know the the team that did it actually today are all luminaries in the tech industry. It was Andrew Bosworth, who's now, you know, Boz, who's running Facebook's uh, AR, VR efforts. It was Chris Cox, who was an engineer at the time and, and then went on to become the chief product officer of the company. It was Ruchi Songvi, who's now, you know, uh, a, an investor and in, uh, one of the preeminent women in Silicon Valley. That was like the team of product managers and engineers that built this thing. Zuckerberg was very public about hating advertising in the beginning, but like he personally didn't like advertising. And it, I didn't think advertising was going to work on Facebook. It was my and obviously I was <laughs> tremendously wrong, but it seemed to me that people didn't want to have advertising between like all this personal stuff, and I wasn't sure advertisers would want it. And the click-through rates were so small. But the num- the amount of volume was so great that it actually all worked out. What was the magic behind the ad network? Why did that work against everybody thinking, this can't compete against Google because Google, you're typing in Volvo, San Francisco, you know, Indian food, Palo Alto. I mean, the intent on Google is insane. The monetization is absurd. So on each individual transaction, Google just wallops Facebook. But then Facebook all of a sudden became a money printing machine. So what did we miss? What did everybody miss? Because I wasn't the only one who thought, this thing isn't going to be able to take on Google. (laughs) Did you actually think it would be able to take on Google? Was the spirit in the company that this will take on Google? What I thought, and I think people misunderstand, I don't think Mark ever hated advertising. Mark didn't like irrelevant advertising. At the Uh, time, outside of search, mm-hmm. most ads on the internet were pretty irrelevant. It was banner ads. They were ugly. The big company at the time behind Google was Yahoo, which basically had you know giant banner ads on their homepage. MySpace was actually a hundred times, lo- or hundred, ten times larger than Facebook when I joined. MySpace had over a hundred million users. Facebook had seven million. And MySpace's model was you know homepage takeover ads. I remember the Hulk when oh, that yeah. movie came out. The Hulk coming out of the you know the homepage at you breaking it apart breaking it apart so that that was that was the kind of advertising that mark you know didn't love but keep in mind from day 1 facebook had ads there were these you know ads on the side that were kind of replicating flyers at college uh, campuses and and um and even banner ads because uh because one of the things mark believed from the beginning was that the company needed to have discipline and that advertising wasn't going to be the business model. And so we needed to learn by actually doing it and see what worked and what didn't work. But the benefit we had and the thing I believed, the reason I believed it could work is Google had proven that ads are not bad. Mm. Irrelevant ads are bad. Relevant ads are actually good. And in, content. And in search, yeah, they're, they're content. And in search, if you took the ads away, and we had a lot of people who joined us from who, from Google who told us this, when they ran experiments where they took the ads away, people complained. Oh, yeah. The ads are additive to the user experience. And so from the beginning, we said, how do we make an ad product that's additive to the user experience? And in the early days, we thought the answer was social ads. We thought the answer was, well, if you can see which of your friends have engaged with a brand that's going to make it relevant. And it this turns out- like the Beacon kind of project? Or yeah, that was shades of it? Ish, yeah, those were all kind of attempts at getting at this sort of idea that, yeah. you know, we know content is more interesting to you when your friends have engaged with it, right? right? If your friend is tagged in a photo, you're more likely to look at that photo than if it's a photo of people that you haven't, that you don't recognize. Right. So how do we bring that same idea to ads? And that was the original idea. You went to see a movie. Behind social ads. I might want to see the movie. So exactly. you put your image under the v- movie or something. Exactly. And uh, and I know Jason has good taste in mu- movies, so I'm going to go see that movie. And that worked. But what ended up really unlocking the value was less the social context around the ads and more the um, liquidity in the auction. Because when you have a lot of ads in a system and you have a really good matching uh, algorithm that uh, is able to show me things that I'm likely to be interested in based on other things I've done, then 
you're more likely to put an ad in front of me that I'm going to be interested in clicking on. And I think everybody had this experience over some period of time where they went from the ads on Facebook are eh to, wow, I find myself engaging with a lot of ads. And it wasn't because your friends were there. It was because the ads were good. Mm. And the things they were showing you were things that you were interested in. And, uh, and I think that's the social equivalent of what search and you know, what Google ended up doing in search. All right. When we get back from this break, I want you to take me to the moment that Yahoo offered a billion dollars and you guys didn't take it. And then we move on to Co2 and this absurdly large startup fund that everybody is confounded about how you're going to put 700 million into early stage startups when we get back on Angel the Podcast. Zeus Living makes it easy to live wherever opportunity takes you. Yes, that's right. Whether you're connecting with investors on the other side of the country or you're opening an office in a new city, Zeus, Z-E-U-S Living offers smart, furnished housing that's cozy and convenient. Zeus can accommodate 30 plus day stays and includes all the essentials like cleaning supplies, kitchenware, and toiletries. And you get great options like a downtown one bedroom if you like the city area or a single family home in a neighborhood you want to explore. Maybe you're thinking of moving there even. And you get flexible booking dates, immediate availability, and minimal paperwork. They've thought this through. Of course, it's got high-speed Wi-Fi, Xfinity, and smart TVs. That's all standard. Zeus is the hassle-free way to streamline your next stay. You can find Zeus living in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and across the Bay Area, Seattle, New York, Washington, D.C., and Boston. Rest assured, you, your family, and your pets will be secure with their digital locks and 24-7 on-the-ground support. For a limited time, Zeus is offering $200, not $100, not $50, but $200, $200 off your first booking, and that's only for listeners of The Angel Podcast. So you're going to go to ZeusLiving.com slash Angel. Once again, 200 from J. Cal and Zeus. Visit ZeusLiving, Z-E-U-S Living.com slash Angel, A-N-G-E-L. ZeusLiving.com slash Angel and get 200 in your pocket right now. Thanks again to Zeus Living for giving such a generous offer to our listeners. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right. This has been one of the most amazing episodes ever. I mean, you were there for Amazon and Facebook, and Dan, there there was this moment where many of the investors begged Mark, from my understanding, to take the billy, the billion dollars from Yahoo for a company that was three years old, which at that time, there were no billion dollar exits. That did not exist in the world. That was when a billion dollars was a lot of money. That's when a billion dollars <laughs> was a lot of money, as opposed to now, <laughs> when a billion dollars is a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. It just doesn't seem that way when Tesla goes up $50 a share in one day. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, did you see that yesterday? Yeah, incredible. Incredible. percent or something. Unbelievable yeah. in a day. Yeah. I mean, wow. where do you put Elon, Bezos, and Zuckerberg in the, in the pantheon of innovators and entrepreneurs? Well, I think um, we already talked about Jeff. Mark uh, is, uh, you know, the amazing thing about Mark is he's still in his mid-30s. Yeah. I mean, think about Jeff started Amazon when he was in his late 20s yeah. and um, and what Mark has already done and he's just getting started. So I think there's going to be, you know, mm-hmm. 20, 30 more years of uh, watching what Mark is able to achieve in the world. And um, I think the world of him, he's, he's you know, uh, I think one of the most exceptional people, not mm-hmm. just business people, but people, human beings I've ever, you know, I've ever uh, met and, and engaged with. And then Elon... I don't have a, a strong opinion. I don't know Elon personally. Oh. Um, I, I, I think a lot of people are hoping that he's successful because the impact that he'll have on the planet and arguably the most important social issue of our time, which climate is climate change. change. And yeah. I think, uh, you know, on the basis of that alone, let's hope that he, that he ends up, you know. So you're one of these people succeed. who believes the scientists. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, scientists can be wrong, okay. Um, you were there when the billion dollar offer came in. I joined right after they turned oh, right it down. After. And in fact, um, I'm really glad they did because if they hadn't, there wouldn't have been a Facebook for me to join in 2006. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Mark's told the story publicly, you know, yeah. that he didn't want to sell. Everybody around him wanted him to sell. It was life changing for really everyone and, uh, and most importantly him, but he just had conviction. And the thing that he knew that he felt people 
outside the company and even some people inside the company didn't really have the same level of belief around is that he was already working on newsfeed hmm. he was already working on opening up the site beyond college to everyone in the world two things that he thought could really dramatically change the trajectory of the business in a way that would make it a lot more valuable and he already had the inkling and was starting to develop the underlying developer platform that would launch in the spring of 2007. Mm -hmm. He knew those things were coming. This was in, uh, you know, the, the timing of this Yahoo offer was um, shortly before I joined. So it was the spring of 2006. He finally said no. Uh, and the story of how he ended up turning that down, I don't know if you know the, no, I don't. the inside story there. Uh, so he... he uh, he was under a lot of pressure from his board and his management team to take the deal. He felt that he couldn't basically say no to all of these people who were his advisors and who relied on him. Uh, he had, if they all wanted to do it unanimously, he had to do it. So he agreed to do it, but he said, we will take not less than a, a dollar, not a dollar less than a billion. It has to be a billion dollars. And they said, great. Cause that was the offer on the table a week before they were going to sign the deal or something like that. Um, Yahoo reported their quarterly earnings and the stock went down and they refused to change the uh, equity that they were offering. So the value of the equity was now something like 850 million. Right. And Facebook went to them and said, hey, you got to increase the equity to make up for the difference. And Terry Semmel said, absolutely not. The deal is the deal. And Mark said, Bye. that's it. We're done. Wow. And never looked Can you back. Imagine if Terry Semmel closed that deal. It would have been what a legacy. Different, but uh, think about spring of two thousand six. Mark, uh, you know, escapes this uh, dilemma. <laughs> um, it's a never looks back, and I joined the company uh, a couple months later, spring of two thousand seven. We've already launched newsfeed and open registration. By the way, the day we launched open registration, the number of new users went from seven thousand a day to thirty seven thousand a day. Oh my lord! And the reason was, at the time, there were thirty thousand people a day trying to join Facebook who couldn't join because they didn't have a college email address. So you knew this. We knew this. Mark they were knew bouncing. This. They were. They getting were bouncing. A, yeah, they were getting. A and the reason like, people didn't think you. he should do it is because they thought, well, if you let people's you know moms on the service, then they're going to stop using it. Well, it turns out, you know, when you add thirty thousand new people, a your growth rate goes up dramatically, but b those people start bringing in their friends. Yeah. And within a couple of weeks, it was up to seventy thousand. Within a couple of months, it was over a hundred thousand. Literally overnight, we went from low single digit thousands of new users to hundreds of thousands of new users. Oh. And then spring of two thousand seven, we launched the developer platform. And shortly after that, uh, I negotiated a deal with Microsoft along with uh, Owen and a couple of other folks. Uh, that valued the company at $15 billion. Right. And that was one of the greatest investments Microsoft ever made. <laughs> it but, didn't look that way at first, but yes. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember out. actually the narrative was they're idiots and they had done it just to get the ads on the network, right? Because there was some ad network we deal, had a deal with combined them, yes. with Bing or yes, something correct. for two years or something. Yeah, that's right. We had to run Bing ads. Actually, half of the company's revenue came from Microsoft at that time. Wow. A deal that I had negotiated after I joined where they basically powered all of our banner ads. And again, remember, Mark didn't believe the future of the company was in banner ads. So he basically said, let's outsource that to Microsoft and let's go spend all of our advertising energy on trying to invent the future of what ads will look like on the internet. How important and how did the Instagram deal go down? Because Twitter thought they had that locked up. Twitter thought they were going to get Kevin Systrom to sell to him. You know, it sounds like I'm repeating myself, yeah. but every one of these seminal moments in the company fundamentally came down to one thing, and that's Zuck. Yeah. He saw the Instagram thing. He wanted to do it. A lot of people didn't think he should. It was expensive. The company was tiny. Uh, it was 18 or 19 people, and he spent a billion on it at the time. Yeah. Less than that, I think. And 15 people. Yeah. You know, some low millions of users kind of thing. Um but he just had this, you know, vision for what it could be and, and, yeah. and no revenue. Be complimentary. No revenue. Like 11, 12 people. Yeah. Billion dollars, 100 million a person. Yeah. And my understanding is he just did it unilaterally because he controlled the board. He was just like, listen, we're doing this. Well, he, you know, he got the management team on board and I was, mm. I was there from the beginning. I really was with him. 
Um, and then he got the board on board. I mean, it wasn't like there was a lot of resistance to it. It was more that, you know, he said, I want to do this. And nobody else had even really considered it. Hmm. And then he did the work of building a relationship with Kevin because it's yeah, buying a company like that. A walk and talk. Well, and he had been investing yeah. in that relationship for, we didn't even realize it, but, but he had been investing in that relationship for, you know, over a year. Hmm. Um, and so this was really all him. What was the company worth when he spent that billion? Was it worth 50? Or? It was uh, shortly before the IPO. Got it. And um, yeah, Facebook itself, probably the last private valuation was maybe, you know, 40 or 50, something like that. Wow. And the WhatsApp was even more significant. That was nineteen billion. And yeah, that was yeah, that was a big swing. And by then we were a public company, so then it was like, wow, what is this going to do to our stock price? And you know, how is how is the market going to react to this? And Mark's, you know, Mark's view was doesn't matter. We have to do this. Right. Um, it'll probably hurt for a while, but you know, he had so much conviction in this yeah. company, this product, uh, and so we did it. And the day after. The acquisition, the stock, Facebook stock went up. The wow. market went. Oh, right. It paid for like half of the market it went, immediately. The market went, wait a minute. This guy's done this before. We trust him. Right. Maybe we should, maybe we should get on board. People forget, but the stock collapsed shortly after it went public. It went public in the 30s and then came down to 17 or something crazy. Yeah, that's right. And it was all based on the fact, if I remember correctly, that you guys just totally botched mobile. You built an, uh, a a wrapper kind of app instead of building a native app. That's right. And good memory. Yeah. Well, I, you know, yeah. You follow these things. I follow these things. <laughs> I have a podcast. I talk about them on the podcast sometimes. We made it. You know what we did is we made the wrong, and I was very involved in this. We made the wrong architectural decision. We thought HTML5 was going to be a thing. We were concerned about uh, native because we had this whole platform on the web. Mm that wasn't going to translate to native. And so we put it we made a big bet on on this idea of HTML5. Brett Taylor and I spent a lot of time working on this along with a bunch of other people. Um, Brett's now at Salesforce running a big part of that company and the 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 story of the IPO is it happened right around the time of the IPO mobile started to take off. Yep. And we didn't ha because we had been spending so much time on the wrong architecture, we hadn't built any advertising into our mobile products. So we literally didn't monetize mobile at all. And right. yet more and more of our users were starting to engage on mobile. And so um, it took us some time to kind of work our way out of that. But what Mark gets credit for is as soon as he realized we had made the wrong decision, he pivoted the whole company. And the problem we had was people at the company, the engineers didn't know how to write code for iOS and Android. So we created boot camps and we put people through those boot camps and we shut down our HTML5 efforts completely. We pushed everyone through boot camp to teach them how to code in this native language. And then Mark said, I'm not going to review any more product designs for the web. Every product review has to start with a mobile design. Mobile first. And force the whole company to kind of move to mobile first. And then we had to figure out how we're going to monetize it. And what the outside world didn't realize at the time was our whole strategy for monetization was to put ads in newsfeed and mm. on mobile newsfeed is the ultimate monetization surface because it never ends yeah. on the web when you're monetizing the right hand column the left hand column the home page it's fixed it's fixed and you translate that to mobile there is no right hand column or left hand mm. column our head of advertising at the time presented to our board and he said I'm struggling to figure out how to make money on mobile because the right hand column on my mobile phone is my thumb. Right. And they were like, just put it in between the posts. Well, Mark said, no, the answer is we're going to put it in newsfeed. We just have to do it in a way that users aren't going to object. So we need to build the right relevancy algorithms. And that's when he promoted Andrew Bosworth uh, to run ads. Bos was, you know, had never worked on ads in his life, but he, like Mark, was willing, was able to see. Isn't that amazing that the entire, a company executing at the highest level, building the fastest growing startup up until that point in time, makes this like little tiny stumble. And all these visionless people then go, you know what? They've done everything right. They tripped once. Therefore, these people don't know how to walk or run anymore. I think and the, they just collapse the stock. It's so dumb. The the challenge was the timing of it, right? And and that, you know, the kind of confluence of all these things happening at the same time. The <clears throat> The, the cool thing for me around that time was I had gone through 
uh, the experience at Amazon where the stock had gone from 130 yeah. to six dollars. And so I had this experience of knowing what that felt like. And I was able to kind of get up in front of the company and say, hey, let me tell you a story uh. about what I experienced at Amazon when this happened. Because, you know, it's a tough thing for a company to go through. Morale yeah. is low. People have all these dreams about, you know, what they're going to be able to do. Pay buy, off their buy a house, buy pay a off house, their, yeah, send pay off their loans. Private school. Exactly. And all of a sudden, it looks like those are slipping away. Um, and of course, by the time I had stood up in front of the company and talked about this, Amazon had, you know, reemerged as a as a huge success story. And so, um, you know, we, we kind of knew that all the pieces were there. We just had to stitch them together. But again, at the end of the day, companies have to demonstrate that they can do it. And that's, that's sort of the challenge. There. Hiring the right people is one of the best ways to help grow your business. You know this, but it shouldn't take your time away from all the other priorities of running your business. With LinkedIn Jobs, it doesn't have to. They know what they're doing. Their system is amazing. LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with the hard and the soft skills that you're looking for so you can find that right person quickly. LinkedIn looks beyond the work skills and puts your job post in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. Things like collaboration, creativity, and adaptability. Now you're wondering, how do they know all this? Well, because they have hundreds of millions of members and they have all the data. That's how LinkedIn makes sure that your job post is seen by the people you want to hire. People with the skills and the qualifications and the other interests that will help you grow your business. It's no wonder that a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn. You know this because you're on there all day. When you have to hire somebody, you go onto LinkedIn, right? It's also why companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. And quality hires is what it's all about. You use LinkedIn, you see all those great resumes, now you gotta use LinkedIn Talent Solutions and you're gonna get $50 off right now. Just visit linkedin.com slash angel. LinkedIn.com slash angel and you get $50. Again, that's linkedin.com slash angel to get $50 off your first job posting terms and conditions apply because they're giving you the 50. There's got to be some terms and conditions. All right. Thanks again to LinkedIn Talent Solutions. You have been a great supporter of the podcast and a great tool for all of the 200 companies that I've invested in. All of them use LinkedIn to find great candidates. If you're a startup, I beg of you, Go to linkedin.com slash angel and get that 50. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. If you look at the two experiences, it's like you have to weather the storm and you have to keep releasing product quickly. Yeah. Speed is important, isn't it? That's right. And I also think the truth is like companies build resilience through these challenging times. And Facebook uh, had been through a bunch of challenging times. Yeah. Um, you know, you build that muscle. And if you don't experience those challenges, then you actually never get a chance to do it. And when the next, when the, the big one comes, you may not be able to recover from it. Build up a little armor. That's right. Well, let's wrap up on Facebook with, they went again from being much like Bezos, the most loved world positive company in the world to now you broke democracy and you got Trump elected. What is the fair analysis from your position of what, Facebook could have done better during the election and all of this, um, you know, Mashugana. And then what are they being unfairly, you know, sort of characterized by for? Because I don't think anybody at the company wants Russians, you know, using Facebook and buying rubles to, to, to subvert democracy, certainly. But things could have been done better. Yeah, and I think they've. I think Mark and Cheryl and others have admitted to that. I think, look, at the end of the day, these are human beings, and they're running, you know, uh, companies that you know where they make mistakes. We talked about the right. mobile mistake, right? We had a, we had an idea of what the world was going to look like, and it ended up looking very different. And so, the the key to me is how do you respond in the face of that? And I think what what Mark has done well is recognize that we were on the wrong path. And immediately snap the company to a new path that is, you know, in in retrospect now the right path. But those things take time. You can't mm -hmm. just, you know, like like with mobile, it wasn't like we could just shift to the native strategy and launch a bunch of good native apps. We had to put a whole team of engineers through boot camp to learn how to code for those platforms. 
And so when you're talking about the changes that the company's been making over the next couple, over the last couple of years, you know, those changes take time. You're starting mm -hmm. to see the, the fruits of that now, I think. And the political ad thing, I'm just curious what you think of that. Twitter said they're not going to take the political ads. Zuckerberg seems to have ground into this, like, you can, we, we can't police the ads. Do you personally agree with that? I don't agree with that. I think they should just take this, take the season off. It's too controversial. Why be so hated? Why not? Because how much do they make on political ads anyway? Like a hundred million or two hundred million? It's got to be a de minimis amount. Why not just sit it out instead of taking all those hours? Why is he so principled yeah. about this particular issue? Because it's confounding to the rest of us. It's just a, the the issue is it's more nuanced than it seems on the surface. And when you start to dig into it, and I think this happened with Twitter where they announced that they weren't going to take any and then they immediately faced a bunch of blowback because there's actually real costs to that policy. What, what is it? I don't get it. Well, uh, Candidates who don't have large followers now have a hard time getting large followers because they can't buy ads. Ah. That's one cost. So incumbents are massively uh, So Trump advantaged. with 50 million members, Yang can't get his 5 million because he can't spend. Uh, it's very hard to draw lines between politics and social issues. And so if mm -hmm. you're going to have a pol blanket policy, then suddenly organizations that want to advertise about climate change may not be able to do that. Uh -huh. So. These platforms are important in the world, and the stewards of these platforms think deeply about the trade-offs when they're making these types of decisions, and the, and then also the the practicality of how enforceable they are, and so on. So, you know, I was there. I know how deeply Mark thinks about this stuff. It's not, um, you know, it's not like he he is blind to the the downsides of some of these policies, but he also is more aware and I think thinks deeper about the nuances and the trade-offs. And at the end of the day, that's kind of the, the challenge of running a large platform like this. Seems to be some belief that Peter Thiel has some Schwengali-like influence over Mark. No, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true either. He's, uh, he's, he's in his ear though. Well, he's a board member. everybody on the board has, has uh, a voice. Um, and Mark is very good at, you know, surrounding himself with diverse perspectives. Yeah. I think that's, again, one of his great strengths is he uh, seeks counsel from lots of different places. He absorbs all of that information and then he comes to his own conclusion about what he thinks the right answer is. Um, and frankly, a lot of people who are covering the company uh, are looking at it through their narrow lens and he tries to look at things through the broadest possible lens. Elizabeth Warren wants to break up the big tech companies. This seems to me to be a really difficult a really difficult thing to do when China's picking the winners in their country and then we're going to break apart our winners. Then don't we by default lose to China if we did that? What what do you think? I think about that's that? I think that's the argument that, you know, a lot of people are making about the again the trade-offs of some of these some of these decisions. Yeah. That, I mean, I could see Amazon spinning out AWS. I mean, how much would that unlock in value? Hard to know. I mean, obviously, it's a massively valuable part Or of YouTube. Business. Can you imagine if YouTube was standalone? Oh, my Lord. All right. How did you hook up with KOTU and what's going on? This seems like a large number, 700 million. Is, are you doing early stage or late stage or everything? Because early stage is what I do. And if you're putting two, $3 million, $4 million into each deal, the math says you have to do a lot of deals. So let me back up for a second because I think a lot of people haven't heard of Co2. Yeah, explain uh, what it is. So Co2 is a uh, uh, started in 1999 by Philippe Lafont, uh, who at the time was working for Julian Robertson, one of the great hedge fund managers of, in history, and started his own hedge fund uh, with $50 million under management in New York City. Uh, a few years later, his brother Thomas joined him, and um, over uh, you know that period of time, and and going through two really bad economic cycles, both the internet bubble bursting and in, in shortly after he started it and then the economic crisis in 2008, um, they built a very successful hedge fund that was largely investing in technology companies, public technology companies. Uh, in 2011, Thomas moved to Silicon Valley and started uh, a growth fund. And the logic was pretty obvious. Private companies are staying private longer, Facebook kind of being maybe the best example of that at the yeah. time. And so as an 
as a public company investor investing in technology businesses, if you're not accessing the private markets now, you, you're sort of at a huge disadvantage because a Why? lot of the values, well, a lot of the value is being created in the private markets. And by mm-hmm. the time these companies go public, there's a lot less opportunity. You know, it, it, Co2 invested in Apple in, in 99, 2000. Uh, was one of their biggest kind of wow. early bets, and you know to to be able to to buy Apple at that time in the public markets, you could obviously have a massive return. But if you know companies are going public now at fifty or hundred billion dollar valuations, how much of a return are you going to be able to get? So they said we need to go private. We need to go late stage private, which looks a lot like what public used to look like for technology. Companies, companies. used to go public at five, ten billion. Less. Amazon went public in 97. I don't remember the exact number, but it was <clears throat> hundreds of millions maybe. Yeah. I mean, if you um, look at Twilio and, and Shopify, they both went low single digit billions public. And even that was, you know, later than yeah. companies used to go public in, you know, the 90s and 2000s. So why, why, why did that happen? Because you were there for Facebook to extend it. This is a deliberate strategy to keep the growth under wraps so you don't inspire competitors. Is it a better life for founders or is it just there's so much goddamn money around that people can do it? I think it's a combination. Certainly for us, it was a combination of um, you can do it now because there's a lot more late stage capital available where, you know, in 97 for Amazon to continue to invest, they had to go public. That was the only way to raise that capital at that time. There weren't these hedge funds. There wasn't this private, you know. Yeah. The idea of growth venture didn't really exist. And so that you know, category emerged at the same time that Facebook was kind of coming up. Um, once, you know, venture investors started to see the, you know, success of companies like Google and and Amazon, they started to realize that you can invest in these companies uh, mm. even at the later stages and still get a great return. Combined with the benefits of staying private, which were that, you know, you got to kind of continue building your business a little bit outside of the the lens of competitors and you can kind of, you know, not have to reveal as much about yourself. Um, And, you know, Mark actually said when we went public that he thinks the company waited too long. Mm. And the reason he said that is because going public has a lot of benefits, but the number one benefit is it forces you to have discipline, Mm. (laughs) you know, going back to that. As Bill Gurley's been saying forever, he was on the board of Uber. He wanted to go public much earlier. And Gurley's been, you know, definitely on this, on this uh, as well. And um, that's the, you know, the benefit of public markets is they do require an enforced discipline. So um, Co2 started doing late stage investing in 2012, 2013, invested in Snap, uh, Lyft, Anaplan, a number of other uh, great companies. And then um, about two years ago, kind of completed the circle, if you will, by raising an early stage fund um, to become, you know, one of... uh, few companies, investors that now do everything from early stage up through public company investing, full life cycle investing. And the idea with the venture fund was twofold. Number one, a lot more money is being raised at the early stage in the same way that, you know, in 2011, 2012, you're starting to see the emergence of these growth funds. Um, Just the opportunity for technology to impact the world and build incredible businesses, you know, continues to compound, as you know, and you're, mm. you know, obviously playing a big part in that as well. And, um, and you can deploy a lot of money in these early stage, uh, in the early stages of these companies, because there's enormous value being created. And number two, KOTU's strategy uh, as an investment company is really around data science and um, building out a data science platform. And so, uh, the firm actually, we have forty-five data scientists on staff at Co2. Are 40, they analyzing early stage science. startups? Those those data scientists. So are what they, they're doing is we yeah. buy an enormous amount of data and we ingest it, and then our data scientists are using that to help us make good investment decisions and help us. What would be an example of that? Assist our have, companies in in yeah. uh, in running their business. What's an example of that data? You get satellite data. You get an app install data. What? Yeah, you, you know, you can you can buy data from a lot of different places now, and 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 you know the the, the data economy is obviously exploding, and so um, a lot of hedge funds are doing this. A lot of hedge it's funds a big edge, huh? buy data, ingest it, and then use it to try to have an edge in making public company investments. Fewer uh, companies are doing that on the private side. Um, mm-hmm. Thomas and Philippe, the two brothers who are the founders of Co2, yeah. uh, kind of had this insight that this data platform that they were building for their public company investments could actually be applied Uh, on the private side. And it turns out if you're going to invest in 45 data scientists and you're going to apply that to public and private investing, 
you might as well apply it all the way down to the early stage because it turns out there's a lot of data that can help you gain insight into which companies are doing well. And more importantly, when you invest in a company, every company now needs to have data science to be successful. And yeah. so you can become mm. their data science platform. Uh, so you can use it to find the companies business. and then you can use it to accelerate the investments you've made. That's right. And in, uh, in, that's in sweet. the way I think about it, and one of the things that really attracted me to to KOTU was, you know, I think venture, uh, the last big innovation in venture was Andreessen Horowitz which had this idea that you know you could build a kind of full service agency like staffing model to help CAA yeah like to help model. help startups mm -hmm. and you know as a venture firm uh, that would be a, a differentiator and i think what we're doing at Kotu is the equivalent of that with data science you read the ovitz book i did how great was that book loved it love michael too i mean this guy came in and just took over the entire industry just by thinking, I mean, you start thinking about strategy. He's like, when I worked as an agent, we all competed with each other. I have an idea. Let's have all the agents in the building work for the client. Yeah. What was your favorite part of the book? Do you have a favorite moment? I just loved how honest it was, you know? And yeah, how, he was how, really self-deprecating yeah. and, and it's candid just, about himself yeah and we know him we both know him personally yeah. and um i think that is that is true to who he is now yeah um i love stories of innovation in mm. business and um and you're right like he really transformed that industry and you know i've been lucky to be part of two companies that have obviously had massive impact and transformational impact on their industries and for me when i was you know ready to leave an operating career and move into investing. Um, you know, I had been angel investing for yeah, a while. Yeah, you did over 100. And so I kind of got my feet wet that way, figured I would learn the ropes with my own money before I started investing other people's money. Um, I wanted to try to do that in a way that was also potentially going to have an impact on the industry itself. And that's mm -hmm. what attracted me to Code2. I think what we're doing with data science has the potential to really move the investing industry forward um, in a you know very innovative and new way, and that's that's why we're having a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, you're. I mean, when you were an individual angel investing your own money, Square, Gusto, Open Door, Flexport, Airtable, Flexport's founders come on the pod. Airtable's He's been awesome. on. Yeah, I, I love mean, Howie. Yeah, I mean, you have just you just crushed it, huh? Well, we'll see. I think in 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 this type of business, as you know, it takes a long time to kind of uh, yeah find out how good you are. And uh, most I think of the you're companies, six, you know, we'll see. Five, most you're five, six, seven. I feel like you know. Yeah, if the company's still. You alive, start to have a pretty good idea, but yeah. <laughs> I, I feel I personally feel like until these companies have exits, and you know, I can really uh, say for sure that this was a good investment. Uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to take credit for it, but I but I do feel lucky, and I think. My approach in angel investing, because I was in a big operating job, I didn't have time to diligence companies and really think deeply about their products. I, I would meet with a founder if I thought they were good, and I felt like I had a pretty good you know, litmus test for that because I had worked for two of the greatest of all time. So signal, I would founder signal. bet on the person. Sure. You know, and these are early stage investments usually, so the idea might change, the product might change, but if I like the person, I would I would bet on them. Um, and then I kind of figured that, you know, if you take an index, effectively an index approach to this, um, then a few of the companies are going to be outliers. And as you said, these you are- You'd only hit one? That's right. What is the strategy with the $700 million fund? Are you doing million dollar checks, $10 million checks? How many investments have you made? How long you've been doing it? And, you know, how does data science play into a two or three person company or, or are you trying to go a little later? So all of the above. We're on our fourth growth fund. So the growth fund that started in 2012, you know, we've 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 yeah. done you know a lot of investing, obviously, in later stage companies. Um, the early stage fund, the venture fund, is a couple of years old. Um, we've hired a great team. We've deployed. You got uh, Mazio, Matt Mazio, who was uh, Chris Sock as number two before he retired. Yeah, exactly. And Karen Maruni, who worked with me at Facebook, ran communications for Facebook, and. Um, you know, as a luminary in Silicon Valley, she joined us recently as a GP. And so we have a fantastic team. Five, 10 people. Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, roughly and, yeah. um, general partners and, and partners and principals. And, and so, um, you know, but we're, 
we're focused primarily on enterprise uh, software, consumer, and fintech. Those are kind of the three categories that we uh, focus on. Obviously, we do stuff. You know, when we see an interesting company or an interesting founder, we'll we'll do other things. But those are the ones that we really uh, lean into, and um, and we do everything from seed to public company investing. It's the smallest check you wrote. I'm curious. Two hundred fifty thousand. Wow. But you know, most of the deals that we're doing are. You know, in the venture fund, most of the deals are leading in the seed A or B rounds, hmm. um, and taking and a taking board, board seat seeds, and yeah. you, know, you believe doing in the governance? traditional, absolutely, you, yeah, critical. Well, what do you think of this sort of party round, no governance approach that we've seen over the last decade? Is it troubling to you? Is it something we need to change here in Silicon Valley? Because, boy, have we seen some weird stuff. Well, I would say as an angel investor, I didn't care about that. In fact, a lot of the angel investments I made were party rounds. Gusto was a great sure. example of that. And, you know, I benefited out. from the fact that Josh made room for people like me, yeah. um, people like you. And, you know, I think it helped him in some ways. And so uh, I never objected to that. I think as a as a institutional investor with LPs, um, you know, we have uh, over $16 billion under management across our hedge fund and our private vehicles. Um you know, we take that stuff very seriously. And I would say as an investor in late stage technology companies, especially, we take diligence very seriously. And we look at every company from, you know, seed up to public through the same lens of diligence to really understand at a deep level, what is this company worth? And um, not just what is it worth today, but what is it going to be worth someday as a How public you, company? What's your methodology for figuring out what the potential is. What do you, what do you think about? And then wh what do you think is important in terms of diligencing and maybe what's something that you don't have to focus too much on that works itself out? Well, obviously it is different. Because you can diligence yourself stages. right out of a deal. That's right. And and you have to balance those things. And yeah. that's, that's frankly part of what my role at the company is, um, coming in as an operator. Um, is to kind of, you know, gut check. Is this a big idea? Is this a great founder? Um, you know, should we be willing to make a bet on this even if, you know, the numbers don't necessarily tie out perfectly? But at the end of the day, we started as a hedge fund. In the public markets, if you're not incredibly disciplined, you can get hurt very quickly. And rem remember, we went through, you know, the team went through 99, uh, 2000 and 2008 right. um, and came out of those two cycles uh, you know, strong, which a lot of hedge funds did not do. And so that is in our DNA. And we're, you know, I think today- More armor, just like Bezos got his armor and Zuck got his, KOTU has theirs. Yeah, and our armor in many ways is our diligence process mm. and our data science. And I think the two of those together kind of combined for us to say, look, we might miss some big ideas because we are, you know, too disciplined. Um, but at the end of the day, that's who we are. We're going to invest in companies that we- really believe are worth what we're paying and um, and that we, more importantly, believe are going to be worth more when they're a public company because we understand how the public markets value these companies. Right. Uh, so it's it's really aligning those two things. The, the eventual exit is going to be a public market exit if it goes well. And so you want to make, make sure those are tight. I, it's amazing to me watching angel investors diligence companies to the point of absurdity. It's in some ways, the opportunity for early stage investing is that things are not yet solved. They're not fixed. The newsfeed hasn't been launched. The Kindle hasn't been launched. They, they haven't reached profitability yet. They lost a billion that year at Amazon. So it is a balance, yeah? It's a balance. And I think in the earlier stage, obviously, there's less of this sort of hardcore modeling because, to your point, the product oh, might change. nothing there. <laughs> but you can still <clears throat> tell a story about what this company might look like if things go the way we're hoping they go. Yeah. And what does that mean in five or 10 years? Like, w is this an idea that legitimately could be worth billions of dollars? And and those are the kinds of questions that we tend to ask at the earlier stages. At the later stages, you know, at the very later stages, we're looking at it purely through the lens of, if this was a public company today, what would it be worth? Ah, interesting. What do you, do you have a percentage you're trying to hit? Do you believe in that style of investing, knowing what you know about how valuable even a small percent of 
your undergraduate and your graduate degrees became worth Amazon and Facebook respectively? Uh, we're, we're actually, I'd say probably more flexible than most people in terms of how we think about it. Yeah. We're not, you know, beholden to, uh, so if you can get you know, to 5%, you'll take it. If you think it's gonna be a rocket ship, you're in, not going to say, give me 15% right, or I'm out. Yeah. In the right situation, yeah. you know, we're, we're, I'd say generally speaking, both flexible and also, um, you know, very oriented towards working with other firms. You know, I come from a partnership background and yeah. so, um, we definitely are, I would say we have, you know, less sharp elbows than a lot of a lot of other firms. But at the same time, if you're going to uh, join a board and put a ton of energy, and as a VC, as you know, you can only do this with so many companies, um, you want it to, you want to have a, enough ownership for it to be meaningful. And so there's a balance there too. All right, as we wrap up here, and thank you for being so generous with your time and, and just all the details of what happened at Facebook and Amazon. It's yeah, just incredible it's stories. The stories. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, you have that signaling for founders. Share with us, if you can put it in words, what is that magic that you see in a founder when you're talking to them? When does the sign above their head light up in neon and says winner? What is it for you? Dan Rose, when you're talking to them, you go, you know what? This person's going to win. Maybe not this company, but in life. I think the, the, the main thing is that they are able to think different in a way that um, is compelling. Think different. They take their own counsel. They're self-possessed. But they can think differently uh, and explain it? They're confident in it? Well, it's not just being confident. It's in, it, they explain it in a way that is genuinely compelling, ah. right? That they, that first, first of all, they have to be able to, uh, think differently than everyone else, because if they don't, then they're just going to build something mm. that is going to, you know, have a lot of competition and, Got it. and, and is going to be replicated. Um, but a lot of people can do that and espouse an idea or a vision that ultimately kind of falls apart when you, test it and uh my my sort of barometer is why is this idea that's clearly not you know a mainstream idea not consensus not consensus why is this actually going to work and they can explain it and, and they can it, explain it and that's yes. a it's a description of the future yes. that people don't see today yes. that holds together Yes, and you have that aha moment where they have now educated you. That's right. I had this with Travis because mm -hmm. the world was telling him surge pricing was the biggest mistake he could ever make. And he was getting pounded. If you remember early on when they had that New Year's Eve and people were freaking out that it 5X or 10X or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he called me and it was a Saturday night at 11 o'clock at night. I, f I remember it because I stepped out of the house to not wake up my kid. And I said, explain it to me. And he said, what's important about Uber is that it's always available. In order for it to be always available, the drivers have to go on the road. What driver is going to go out on New Year's Eve and have people abuse them, drunkenly puke in their cars without getting compensated for it? We can't force them. And if it's snowing and it's a thunderstorm and they can only drive five miles an hour, I would rather they get paid, you would rather they get paid five times as much and you have that availability. If it's not available, you're going to be more upset by us. So the consumer doesn't actually know what they need. It's better to have it available and be able to pay the driver 5X, which is what they get. Yeah. It's to incent them to get on the road. That's and right. it's the same thing Bezos did. When he said, you have to kill the existing business and do that Kindle. That's right. And it's the same thing Zuckerberg said, when we have to buy Instagram, because yeah. this is the future, even if it's just 11 people, yeah. I know it's the future. Yeah. But you have to be able to articulate mm. it. And this is the thing I think, mm. you know, founders, obviously you have to be visionary, but you have to be able to back that up with an articulation. And then you also have to sell it, mm. you know? And one of the things when, when I joined Facebook, Mark was you know, very young, he would still, he would have still been in college if he hadn't left to go start the company. Um, and, and one of the things I would tell him in the early days was Jeff was a brilliant salesman. He would have an idea and then he would go convince everybody around him that that, that idea, that that idea was right. And it's not, that's not the most fun part of the job. 
Because when you're selling something, you're basically repeating yourself over and over and over again. In fact, if you watch Jeff in his public, uh, uh, you know, when he's been in the public, he basically has been telling the same stories for 20 years. Sometimes you'll listen to him and you'll be like, I've literally heard everything he's already said, maybe yeah. five or six times. But that's the brilliance of being a master salesman. It's like a politician. You're yeah. on a stump and you have to just keep repeating yourself because most of the people in the room haven't heard you before. Yeah, it's the job of but management it's boring. to repeat yourself over and over it's, and make people feel great. And, and, and sell your idea. Yeah. And so I think for a founder who has a great idea and is compelling in their articulation of why that idea is right, they also have to embrace the role of repeating that idea over and over, selling it to their investors selling it to their employees, yep. selling it to their customers, selling it to their stakeholders uh, until it becomes accepted as correct. Yeah, it, it becomes self-fulfilling. Self-fulfilling. Dan Rose, an amazing 75 minutes. You missed three phone calls to stay here for an extra <laughs> 20 or 30 minutes, but I appreciate it. Thanks it's for long overdue. A lot and, of fun to uh, be with you. If people want Congrats to- Congrats to you, Jason, on everything, seriously. Uh, we've yeah, known each other for 12 or 13 years. We've known each now. other for yeah. a long time. And, you know, it's just, I feel so privileged that at some point, Ruloff at Sequoia said, hey, here's some money. Can you go invest it? Because you introduced me some Smart great for them. <laughs> it worked out for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Good I invested 700000 for them and it, it worked out. Yeah. And, and, you know, and it, it really is, I think, one of the great jobs in the world- that we have. I agree. To just sit with smart people and, and have them tell us, you kind of framed it perfectly, which is, this is the future. Let me explain to you why this is the future. Mm -hmm. And then you get that juice of being able to be part of it. That's Isn't right. that great? So just to fun. be part of so many things that change the world. It's really fun. It's it a, is the greatest. The You're enjoying fun. it. I'm I can tell. It. Oh, yeah. I've never had more fun. And I've had incredible, you know, incredible Two great careers. rides. Yeah. But you know what's great about this ride? You can sleep at night. <laughs> when you're on Facebook and things are blowing up. Yeah. I mean, how many nights did you grind your teeth looking at the ceiling saying, oh my God, tomorrow we got to go in and solve these big problems. The fun thing about venture is you get to see so many different things. Yes. And when you're in operating roles, you're basically heads down. You're working on one thing. And that's really fun. Four years you for have the Kindle, a big role five in that years for thing. the news feed. Yeah. Like you, have, you have to focus on one and thing. And you own that thing, which is the beauty of operating. But in venture, you get to, you get to dabble and you get to- you get to see a lot of stuff. Did you miss your window as a founder? You said before you wanted to be a founder. Now look at this. You got seven hundred million under management. The greatest gig you could ever have. Two greatest gigs. Are you yeah. ever going to be a founder? Because now, no. what, how old are you now? I'm in my mid forties, and yeah. you know what? After I joined Facebook, I done? realized I actually a probably wouldn't be a great founder. Why? I think I'm more of a scaler. Ah. You know, I think even Kotu has been around for twenty years. I'm helping mm. the I'm helping the firm scale, um, and the reality is that after Amazon and Facebook, there was no way I was going to be able to do something that came close. And so uh, I decided yeah. to do investing instead. It's a lot of fun. I get to help founders and um, you yeah. know, it's perfect for me at this stage. And you can sleep at night. <laughs> you don't have to grind your teeth like, <laughs> oh my Lord. That's the thing about being an entrepreneur. I explain this to all these precious VCs who are like writing tweet storms on Twitter about, here's how you have to email me as a founder. I don't know if you saw that. I insanity one, yeah, yeah so. just like vcs are like here's the proper way to email me and it's like um opening up your email is the easiest thing you can do in life <laughs> like read the goddamn email yeah. and respond and thank people for sending you their pitch that's right what's the best way to pitch code to as we end What's the best way to get in touch? I mean, uh you can reach out to me drose at code2.com. Correct answer. I respond to everything. Correct I answer. I learned that from Cheryl Sandberg. Respond to everyone and every email, and good things will happen. How much of Facebook's success is she responsible for? A big part. A Huge. Mean, a major part. And a big part of my career, too. She really transformed my career. If Zuckerberg went into politics or decided to take some time off, she's the likely CEO of that company. She'd be a great CEO, you think? I don't know the answer to that, who, who it would be, but I don't think Mark's going anywhere. He's not going anywhere. She should be the she should be the CEO of a company. I wish she had taken over Uber. There was talk of her being CEO of Uber. I don't know. I honestly don't. Wouldn't know. that been I amazing? don't. I don't know uh, if that's oh. true, but I do. I think of the world of Cheryl. She's yeah. exceptional. And politics, right? I mean, God, she would be a great president. She's an incredible leader. Soft? Why? Soft power, hard power, just in raw intelligence, EQ, IQ, everything, right? She's complete uh, package. She's 
the the complete package and more than anything else um she uh she really gets people you know that simple things like this idea that you should respond to everyone all the time it's a it's such a basic you know thing to to do it takes a little bit more work um but the benefit of being that person that somebody knows when they reach out to you you're going to respond yeah it's just massive it's massive and it's I, a basic yeah. human thing yeah she's so impressive to me i wish she would be president or vice president <laughs> or something just if you think about her on a ticket her and bloomberg or her and hmm. you who you like you got somebody you like <laughs> you don't like to talk about politics i I'll, you like I'll, Bloomberg? I'll pass on the politics, but do you think of I follow Bloomberg on Twitter, and I do uh, I admire him a lot. Oh, God. Yeah. If Bloomberg could be president, wouldn't that be the most amazing unlock? He's exceptional. He's exceptional. A, he's exceptional. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jason. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Dude, you crushed it. Bye.